Well, good morning. It's great to see you guys here today, whether you're at Bearden online or here at our Maryville locations. Good to see you guys. If you've got a Bible, let's go to the book of Philippians chapter four, or you can uh, dial up the uh, FC app and follow along today. How many parents in the room, when your kids were, were little, you were with maybe another family and your kids were playing and enjoying themselves and all of a sudden your kid you know, starts to fight over a toy and they're like, no, this is my toy. And then your kid like shoves the other kid to the floor. Like when that moment happens, you don't like turn to your friend and go, kids are such a joy. <laughs> I'm so proud of that one right there, right? Why? Because you're not proud of your kids when they're selfish, right? That's just not the natural thing uh, for us to do. Um, I remember when uh, Pastor Greg's daughter, Cora, was like three years old, and so we were eating as a family, and she had this bag of chips, and she was eating, and so I, was, I went up to her, and I said, Cora, can, can Uncle Trent have a chip? And she reached into the bag, and she pulled out this like scrummy little piece of a scrap of a chip, and she tried to give it to me, and her mom, uh, Grace, said, Cora, give Uncle T the best chip, right? She's trying to teach her daughter how to be generous. So Cora reaches in and she grabs like this big, massive, beautiful chip and she starts to give it to me and then she kind of does one of these deals and right in her mouth. And I just laughed and never forgot that day. Uh, and, and the reason is because like kids aren't naturally generous, right? And if we, were, if we would be honest, like as adults, we're not naturally generous people. We have to be taught how to do that, sometimes kicking and screaming how, how to do that. And the reason is because we have a proclivity to selfishness. Uh, because of our sinful, fallen nature, we tend to be very selfish people. Uh, today, we are in part six of our sermon series called This Is Us. And so for the last six weeks, we've been talking about the statements that really align us as a church, that actually uh, give us uh, uh, really a direction. Uh, it unifies us. And these are all biblical concepts that we believe God is calling us to embrace. And today, I wanna talk about this core value, which says generosity is a lifestyle. And so you've heard us talk about this, and today I wanna expand on why this is so important. When we say generosity is a lifestyle, we're saying it's all about giving to the vision to make disciples of Christ. And so to be clear, when we say be generous, we're talking about financially giving to God's church. And so that's the attention we want to grasp and begin to understand uh, today. Uh, to truly be a generous person like Christ is calling us uh, to be, it's not gonna happen just by throwing a couple of dollars you know, into the offering plate or into the giving station today. To truly be a generous person, it means that You've created habits in your life, uh, ongoing habits of, of generous giving in your life. It becomes who you are. It's a lifestyle choice that you uh, decide and choose to live. It becomes a way of actually living. And today in our scripture, we're gonna see why we need to pursue uh, generosity as a lifestyle. We're gonna see that it's not about an amount that you might give, it's really about a lifestyle that you live. And here's the reality. Numbers tell us the truth, right? This is one of those things that you just really can't argue with. Uh, you could probably argue and, and make a case that you are a nice person and kind of give some examples of, of that. You could probably give an argument uh, and give some examples of, of how that you, know, you love Jesus. And so you could, you could argue one way or, or another, right? I could argue that in last night's game against Ole Miss, that was the first down, right? I could argue that. But when it comes to like money and generosity, like, like our bank statement really tells us the truth. And even when you refuse to tell the truth, your bank statement, where your money is actually going, will always tell us the truth. Now, I know what some people in the room, there's some guys in the room that every time, you know, a pastor talks about money, it tenses up and like, what does this guy know? And why, why are we talking about this? And, and so don't, don't throw any mustard bottles at me today. <laughs> Maybe you could throw some Pro-V ones up here, but just make sure I'm looking. 
I'll gladly take those if you watched the game last night anyway. Um, but here's the reality. Like when you read the Bible, it is filled with biblical truth and principles about how to steward our money well. So God's gonna bless you with a certain amount of resources and you can, you can be a good steward and, and manage that in the right way or you could use it all for yourself. And so the difference though is like when we wanna honor Jesus and we wanna honor the Lord, then we, we use it and, and we manage it well as he shows us and teaches us in his word. And then as a result, the stuff that we do have, he gives us the ability to enjoy it, right? That's crucial because a lot of us have a lot of stuff. We live in America, we have a lot of stuff, but at the end of the day, stuff doesn't make us happy. If you remember the sermon series uh, we went through on the book of Ecclesiastes, we learned that it is God who gives us the ability to enjoy things. And if we're not being a good steward of what we have, then he's not gonna allow us to even enjoy what we do have. So it's vitally important that we understand why we're called to be generous and, and how to actually do that. Because when we do, not only will we enjoy what we have, but we'll we'll be able to honor and worship him as he calls us to. And in in the book of Philippians is just filled with what it looks like to be generous. And in chapter four, we're gonna see what a generous person actually does uh, with the things that God has given to them. And so we're gonna jump in to Philippians four, beginning in verse 10. Paul says this, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now that I am speaking of being in need, for I have, sorry, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. A couple uh, thoughts today about what this passage is actually teaching us. And the first thing is this. Generosity reveals your love for others. It reveals your love and your concern for other people, right? When I'm generous, it reveals that I actually love you or I'm concerned about you. So look at verse 10 again. He says, you have revived your concern for me. Now, why can he say your your concern for me has been revived? It's because he read a Facebook post and, and they, you know, they said something really nice about him and he said, oh, look at that post, that means the world to me. No, of course not. He didn't run into them at the grocery store and and then them say, hey, how are you doing? Good, good to see you. And then walk away, oh, he's concerned about me. Of course not. He knows that they are concerned about him because they are actually giving their money to fund the ministry that he is a part of. I love how the New Living Translation writes verse 15. He says, it says, you Philippians, were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. So no other church was giving. Paul had planted many churches. No one was funding, no one was being generous uh, and, and giving and providing for him. The Philippian church was the generous church that was actually doing so. And so you can't say essentially that you're concerned about people going to heaven if you are not giving towards the ministry. You cannot say that you care about the gospel or you're concerned about the gospel if you are not giving to God's church. It's just that simple. Generous people will be concerned and that love and concern will be evidenced by their generosity. I love how 1 John chapter three presents it to us. It's so simple. 
John says, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Isn't it so simple? Sometimes it's hard for us to live out the Bible, but when we read it, it's like, wow, that's really simple. If you have the world's goods, in other words, you have material possessions, you have money, right? And you see a brother that is in need, you see needs in our community and you refuse to actually give and you refuse to actually step in to help. He says, how can the love of God be in you? Now think about how God works. Having money is never the sin. Like having money, money is not a sin. Like having a lot of it is not bad. It's actually a good thing. In fact, if you have the world's possessions and you have a lot of it and the love of God is in me, in you, it means that you're gonna actually help a lot of brothers out, right? And so for us, we wanna see and know that true generous people are concerned about the gospel. They're concerned about God's church. Secondly here, we see that generosity is connected to contentment. So there is, there's something that goes hand in hand here. Like being content is connected to generosity. So you're never going to be content if you don't learn to be generous, right? I think that's worthy to write down. You're never going to be content until you learn to be generous. You see, some people in the room and listening today are, are probably struggling with envy. You're probably struggling with this inner desire to have more because there's something inside of us that just always wants a little bit more. You know, we get a raise, it is great for a while, but by the time, you know, six, seven months go, you know, pass down the road, we're thinking about, you know what? If I had just a little bit more, then we could do this or then we could do that. And so we struggle with contentment uh, on a consistent basis. That's why Jesus said a man's life does not consist of the abundance of the things he possesses. In other words, you know, you could spend your entire life getting more and more and more and st uh, stuff, right? And that's not uh, necessarily a bad thing, but if that's uh, the desire of your heart and you're trying to find happiness and joy in that stuff, Jesus is reminding us that you're not gonna find life in it. You're not gonna find joy in it. And on the other hand, he's calling us to live a life of love. He's calling us to live a life that would be a part of making disciples and taking the gospel to this world. And the biggest difference I think is this. A lot of us will see and, 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 and take the money that we have and we will, we, will, we will love money and then we will use people to get more money. But the Bible tells us over and over again and, and for you and I as followers of Christ, we don't, we don't wanna use people because we love money. We actually wanna flip that. We wanna love people and use the resources that God has given to us to bless, to make disciples, and to use it for God's glory. And that's the biggest switch that some of you need to, need, need to begin to realize. That a majority of your life has just been seeing money as something that you just have to get to spend on yourself, and really it's just a tool. It's really all it is. It's a tool that God gives to you and he gives to me that we might use it under the leadership of the Holy Spirit to actually love people. Every time I'm generous to God with money, I'm saying what matters most to me. And Paul is saying here, in my life, I've had money, I've had power, and I've, 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 I've learned to live with that, but I've also learned to live when I don't have much. He, he's been rich, he's had power, he was a leader in his city, right? And then now in his life, he is learning and, and, and able to say, I don't have anything. I, I gave all that up. I don't have it anymore. He was actually in prison when, he's, when he wrote this letter. And so he can honestly say, I've got nothing. And, and what he is saying is I've learned the secret of being content. I've had a lot and I've had nothing. And there's a secret that you've got to, you've got to understand. And the, un, and the understanding he wants us to gain is that we can do all things 
through him, through Christ who gives us strength. Now you've heard that verse before, you've seen it often. You know, we, we quote that verse, I can do all things in, uh, through Christ who gives me strength. And essentially what he means by that verse is he's gonna give you success on the football field if you just write it underneath your eyes right here or you write it on your shoe, boom, success, you're gonna win. Of course not. We like to pick stuff out of the Bible and kind of use it as we, you know, please. But the secret, and anytime you read you know, this is the only time I think that in the whole Bible where someone says, here's a secret to life, right? We're always wondering what's, what's going on. Like, what's the secret to life? Paul says the secret to contentment, right? As he's talking about financially living his life, having a lot and learning how to live not, with not very much, he's saying the secret is this. I can do all things that Christ wants me to do I can do all things that he's asking me to do, that he's calling me to do. And I'm going to do all of that stuff, not by the power and money that I have, but it's going to be through the strength that he gives. You see, the, the, the problem with money is it gives us this complex of, of, of authority. As, as our income increases, we begin to take need, uh, we begin to, be able to take care of our needs and, and we're able to do these things. And as we're doing these things, it builds up our, our, our pride to think that, oh, it's me that's doing this and it's me that's paying for this and it's me and it's me and it's me and I've got this thing under control. And so we start to think that, oh, I grew this business. Oh, I was a part of growing this ministry. Oh, I was a part of making this. And Paul says, no, 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 the secret is being content. The secret is that it wasn't money And it wasn't power, it was Jesus Christ working in and through you. That's the secret. So that should lead us to a place of contentment. You see, we often think if I just had more money, then I would would be happy. And Paul says, no, 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 more money is not gonna make you happy. Happiness is gonna come through Christ who gives you strength. We think, oh, if I could just find a a career that fulfills me, then I'll I'll, I'll, I'll have purpose. And Paul says, no, no, no. You're not gonna find ultimate purpose in a career or uh, being successful in a career. He says, you're only gonna find that through Christ who gives you strength. Now, I think there are many reasons, but I wanna mention at least two reasons why we don't think that, that, that we're not content. And the first reason that we, you know, when we're not content with what we have is we think that uh, we don't have enough. And so when I think that we, when I don't have enough, then I'm constantly trying to get more, right? And so if we're struggling with that today, that desire to have a little bit of more here and more here and more here, oftentimes what we say is after I get what I want, then I'll give what God wants. If you're struggling with contentment, we don't think we have enough. And so then we start thinking, after I get what I want, then I'll give God what he wants. The scripture tells us that if we're faithful with a little, we'll be faithful with much, right? And so some of us are in this this conundrum. This is is how we're living our life and we're kind of fleshing this out. When I get things under control, then I'll be able to give what God wants. But we're living in this uh, culture and society that is, is so designed to make us feel discontented. Everything about media, everything about advertisement is, is a way to make us feel like we don't have something, like we're discontented. And social media is like our gateway drug right now. You know, you've, you've heard that, like you start to smoke marijuana, it's the gateway drug, the deeper you know, drugs and more dangerous drugs and Well, social media is that gateway drug that leads us to deeper sin, deeper sins of anger and jealousy. And and the reason is because, you know, social media is like a a family photo album, right? And so when you, you know, back in the day, we actually like printed photos out. Does anybody have like photo albums? Like, and then at Thanksgiving and Christmas, like you would like bring out the photo albums. You kind of look through and, oh, look at this. And and those were great pictures. And, And you never put like the bad days in your photo album, did you? I remember that one. I almost killed you that day. <laughs> you don't put those in there. And so it's, it's not necessarily that 
so, social media is that, like, we look at it and it's like, oh, they only put the good stuff. Well, of course so. Of course, of course they're gonna do that. That's what we do. But the problem is that how I view it when I'm looking at it, I might think, oh, my day stinks compared to that guy's day. Look what he's doing. And now I'm discontented. Or maybe I see somebody do something and now I get angry at them. I don't even know them, but I start judging them. Well, they shouldn't do that. They shouldn't be going there. And if I had what they had, I wouldn't do that, God. And now all of a sudden we're angry. Now all of a sudden we're bitter. Why? Because we've allowed social media to bring us into a dark place of being discontented with what God has given to us. And so when you're not content, you don't think you have enough. And so secondly, when you're not content, you don't trust God. The reason why we don't give away something is because we're afraid that then we won't have something. If I give this away, then I won't be able to do this. And so this comes down to a trust issue. And so then what we start to say is in our minds, my way is better than God's way. God is calling me to trust him and to do this, but I'm not going to because my way is better. I think I can get happiness in a better way and in a different way. I think I can find joy in this way or in that way. And Paul is saying in verses seven to eight that whatever gain he had, all the wealth and the power and the knowledge that he had before Christ, he says, I count it as loss. It is garbage to me. He's saying, now that I know Jesus, I finally realize what real living actually is. I finally understand what purpose is all about. I finally understand what all of this stuff that he has given me is for. And when you think about all the things that you highlight, the things that you focus on in your life, what it actually shows you is what really matters to you, what you love, what, what, what concerns you. And Paul is making it clear. All those outside things that I gained outside of Christ, I consider worthless. Consider it worthless. Let's keep going. Number three, generosity is more effective when we partner together in the gospel, right? So in verses 14 and 16, he's talking uh, to all of these great people in the city of Philippi that have been given, giving to him and he calls them partners in the gospel. And so it's, it's, it's not a surprise that, that when we partner together, we can do far more than we ever could on our own. In verse 14, he said, you shared in my troubles. Right? And so when you are serving alongside, shoulder to shoulder someone, you're giving and serving for the mission of God, there is a common bond that just develops and grows there. You know, it's like you're in a battle together. And he said, you, you shared in that trouble and these troubles with me. Verse 15, he said, no other church partnered with me like this. Nobody else was giving, only you were giving. If you read the whole book of Philippians, you'll see the church prayed for him. The church encouraged him, but obviously, yes, the church also gave financial gifts to him. And verse 15 says more than once. So it's not like, oh, here's a one-time gift, see you later. No, it was a commitment, right? They were partnered together for the long haul, right? And listen, when we partner together here at FC, when we decide that we're gonna, we're gonna combine our resources, our efforts, our time, our talents, our treasures, all for the glory of God, God does amazing things. In fact, today we're baptizing, I think almost a hundred, our hundredth person as a church just this year. And that's just something to celebrate and, and to know that God is working in our midst. We know that we just renovated a 30,000 square foot building. I, I, we couldn't have done that alone. Could, could you have discipled 100 people? Could you have baptized 100 people? Could you have led 100 people to Christ? The, of course not, we're better together. Could we have renovated this building just you know, by one or two people? No, of course not. We're better together when we partner. So far this year, 53 teenagers have given their life to Jesus just since January. That's amazing. Could you have led 53 people, teenagers to Christ? <laughs> no, I couldn't, you couldn't, but together, we are better. We've got small groups who are connected to foster care families and 
ministering to them on a daily basis, uh, the various needs that they have. We have small groups connected to uh, schools at Rockford Elementary that, that they could bless them and, and be a support for those classrooms. We've got people serving those who have just been released from prison, uh, helping them transition into uh, society yet again, whether it's donating backpacks to refugees or serving in all of these various capacities. We do this all for the glory of God. And as a church, when we partner together, we're better together. And this is what Paul is saying. You and I are more effective when we partner together for the gospel. I'd say that if you're giving FC, you're getting a pretty good return on your investment. Uh, the reason why we don't use the word here, member, become a member of Foothills Church is because of this book. Um, when we were first starting and I'm reading Philippians, I'm like, man, I, I really am drawn to that word because when I say the word member, it kind of makes me think of like this country club feel. Like, hey, just join the country club and when you get here, you, you get the special locker room and the towels and we've got the bottled water for you here and you got all the setup and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, nah, that's not, country club feel is not what we're going for. We, we wanna get to this idea that, yeah, we're really partnering. So to be a partner, you are a part of the work together. Right? And so we, we, we chose that intentionally because we know that every single one of us is needed as co-laborers together to take the gospel to this community. Uh, when we become partners, we actually are saying, you can count on me. You can count on me. You know, in a, in a society that is like a church hopping society and I'm in and I'm out and I don't know and no, we don't want accountability and we don't want anybody like involved in what we're doing. Like that's the, that's the society that we live on, particularly here in the South. And so when we say, yeah, I wanna be a partner, we're saying you can count on me. And, and yes, I want leadership in and through um, my life. When we become partners, we're also modeling what the early church did. So it's a biblical concept. When we partner together, obviously we can do so much more together. And so that's why it's important. Uh, maybe you need to take that step um, of becoming a partner here at FC. Number four, generosity is credited to your heavenly account. Look at verse 17. Like, maybe you don't know this, but every dollar that you give for God's kingdom is actually recorded. There's like a, a heavenly bank statement, right? And listen, it's not about an amount, it never is. It's all about the heart behind it, right? But everything that we give, everything that we sacrifice for God, he puts on this balance sheet, so to speak. It's why Jesus said, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He said it six times in the New Testament. Now listen, anytime Jesus repeats himself, we need to listen. And I think the point is very clear. You wanna make sure that as you live your life, you are doing and investing into things that are going to last forever. We live in a, a life that is temporary, but eternity is forever. So doesn't it make sense for us to focus more of our time and energy on uh, things that are gonna last forever? Like trees are gonna come down, country's gonna come down, like nothing on this, this earth will last. There are only two things that last forever, the truth of God and people. So there, there is something that is going to last forever. Let's talk about that for a second, uh, especially young people. There is something called absolute truth. It is not for you and is not for me to decide what is true and right for me. Um, I'm too sinful and selfish I always think about myself first and I'm constantly fighting with that, right? I want what I want um, and, and, and so do you because of our sin nature. And so that, that precludes us from having the mental and moral capacity to be able to decide what is actually truth, not your truth, but what is actually true and what is false. And so the scripture teaches us that God is our moral authority. He is creator. And because he is creator and because he is holy, that he has created truth and what is true today was true 2,000 years ago and it'll be true 10,000 years in the future. If it is true today, it is always going to be true, even in eternity. The other thing that lasts forever are people. 
Everybody here is gonna last forever somewhere. It's gonna either be separated from God in a place called hell, or it will be with God in eternity in heaven. And so that's why Jesus came to this earth. He came to live a perfect sinless life. He came to show us what love is. God sent him on a mission to die on a cross for our sin, being the payment for our sin. That if you would believe in Jesus, put your faith and trust in him as savior, that he died for you and rose from the grave, giving you the ability to have your sins forgiven, the Holy Spirit of God then given to you that you might live a life on mission for him and then spend an eternity in heaven with him. Like then it makes sense that, that we would spend our energy thinking more about eternity, more so than what's happening today and what's happening like this week that I need done. Like there are bigger things happening in the world. And if we wanna be generous, if we wanna understand what it, what it truly looks like, we begin to understand that everything that we give is credited to our account. God is gonna bless us for it. Number five, we learn here that generosity is actually an act of worship, right? It's an act of worship. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, he calls this gift that they give a fragrant offering. It is a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. So when we give, we are making a sacrifice, obviously. If I give money, that is money that I can't spend on me, right? That is a sacrifice. I give something up for something that I love even more, right? And so then it is an act of worship to, to give. It's a sacrifice. He calls it a fragrant offering. Now that sounds a little weird. Like what does a fragrant offering actually mean? Well, in the Old Testament, to worship God, to have your sins forgiven, you would bring a sacrifice, an animal to actually sacrifice. You could do this at, at any time to, to renew your relationship with God and to actually get forgiveness. But this word burnt offering literally means to ascend or literally to go up in smoke. And so what they would do is they would bring a bull, a goat, a lamb. They would bring it to the temple. The priests would uh, sacrifice it, skin the animal, cut it into parts. I know, a little gruesome. And then they would place the parts on the altar. And underneath the altar was a fire. And the fire would burn and then the, the, the meat would roast and to, it would begin to go up into the air as smoke. They would disintegrate the, the, the animal, so nothing would be left. And as the smoke was rising into the sky, that became known as this fragrant offering. Leviticus 1.9 says it's a soothing aroma to the Lord. And so when Paul talks about this generous financial gift to the ministry as a fragrant offering, he's saying this is your sacrificial gift to God. You are sacrificing something that is valuable to you for something you think is even more valuable, right? And that's the truth behind generosity and giving as a sacrifice. It means we are giving something valuable away to something we love even more. Now, when you think about like when, we are, when, when we're generous, I can't make you worship Jesus more. Right, as much as I want you to, I can't, I can't make you, I can't make my kids worship Jesus. I can't make them love Jesus. And the reason is because only you can give your worship to God and only, only your kids can give their worship to God. We can't force this you know, around uh, or, or, or to you know, force this on someone else. And so that's why it can be a little bit challenging. We hear the, the government talk about being generous and like, hey, it's, it's real easy to give other people's money away, right? Like, yeah, when, my, when I give my kids money, like sometimes they waste it on stupid stuff, you know? It's like, why did you buy that? You know, that's dumb, that's terrible. Or why did you buy so much food? You didn't even eat it, right? Why? Because it's easy to spend someone else's money. I started thinking about this week and, 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 and the thing that begins to help us when it comes to generosity to God is we begin to realize that none of what I have actually belongs to me. We don't get to take anything that we currently have with us when we die. Like it all stays here. 
And so when I begin to understand that everything I have actually belongs to God, every dollar that I have all belongs to him, then it becomes a little bit easier for me to give back to him a portion of what he's already given to me. Generosity is an act of worship. And then finally, number six, generosity ensures you are fully supplied, fully supplied. In other words, when you and I are generous, God is gonna supply all of your needs. Now think about this. He, he, he says, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Couple of things, all of your needs, it doesn't just mean you're gonna be able to pay your bills. Like you can trust that, that God's bank account is big enough to take care of your bills. As you are faithful and you're not dumb with money, like we've all been dumb with money, but we get our act together, we start being wise with money. As I give to God, He's going to supply all the need that I have to take care of the needs that are in my life, right? But that's not the only thing He supplies. Sometimes we think only in terms of money when we read this. When you are generous, God is gonna supply all your needs, all your needs. How's your marriage today, right? How's your, how's your sense of purpose? How's your sense of joy? All of these needs that we have, he's saying, listen, as you live a life of generos generosity, as you are giving, I'm gonna fill you. Not according to Trent's bank account or your neighbor's bank account, but according to his account, which is infinite, right? Mine's not gonna get you far. Your, your, yours may not get you too far, but his is an infinite account. And he says, you can depend on him. He's gonna take care of everything as you are faithful with what he has given to you today. You say, can I claim verse 19 if, if I'm not being faithful? I don't think so. I don't think you can claim the fact that God's gonna supply all of your needs if you're not being faithful in what he's given to you. And so, yeah, I think there's some changes that need to be had. I think all of us have to be honest. All of us want to get to a place of where we're actually investing in things that are going to last for eternity, right? That's what's going to bring us joy. And so here are a couple things. If you're already giving to FC, today I hope is an encouragement. Like what you are giving and doing, it's like God is doing miracles with. He's taken like a small, you know, couple of loaves of bread and you know, a couple of fish and, and 53 teenagers are coming to faith and 100 people are getting baptized and churches are being planted. So like a return on investment is happening. So be encouraged. Secondly, I would say, do not forget that when you give, this is an act of worship. So some of you have been giving so long, the tendency is like, oh yeah, that's just what I do and I don't think about it. And I wanna, I wanna encourage you, don't just not think about it. Every time you see it come out of your, your statement or every time you give, just say a prayer, just say, God, this is my sacrifice to you. I love you, I worship you. Let that be a part of your worship every Sunday, every time it comes out, that you would say, God, I give this to you. Now, secondly, if you're not giving, like I would encourage you to do this. I, I believe it's gonna bring joy in your life. I believe it's gonna bring blessing in your life. You say, well, what do we give? Well, I think the scripture says a percentage gift is, is what we should do because that's wise and smart. I think the Bible teaches 10%, but I would say wherever you're at, choose a number. Choose a number and just say, this is what we're gonna do. And we'll grow and we'll, we'll figure this out, but start somewhere. And when you do, and, and as other parts of your life are coming into God's will and coming in track of where he is calling you as you are serving and you are faithful, I truly believe God's gonna bless. I truly believe God's gonna honor what we give. And the reason I can say that is because I've seen it in my own life. My wife and I got married. She was a school teacher making $21,000 a year. I was in full-time seminary. And we gave 10% of that and we lived in an apartment and we didn't get to do much fun stuff and we didn't go out a whole lot. And, and uh, it, was, it was rough, it was rough. And my first church and things, you know, I know what it's like to have very little. But even in the midst of that, we made a commitment at the very beginning of our marriage. We were always gonna be faithful givers. We were gonna be generous. We just, we just, wanted, we just wanted to put that on the table first and foremost as a way to put God first in our life. 
And, and after 21 years of marriage, God has been faithful and God has blessed in many ways. And as, as we continue to see increases, we continue to allow that, that increase to happen as well. And as we do, I can just say, just from my own personal testimony, that's one of the most powerful things we've ever done as a couple, um, even when we struggled to put God first and have faith in Him. And so I wanna encourage you to do the same so that you might experience the same faith and growth and love that I have. Let me ask you to bow your heads and let's pray over our time together as we close out with the reminder that God is gonna be faithful. Whatever He's calling you to do, whatever he's asking you to do, like God's gonna be faithful. He's not gonna ask you to do something and then leave you hanging. He's not gonna ask you to take a step of faith and then just like walk away from you. No, he's, he's going to step in. He's going to provide, he's going to bless. And that's part of the joy of having our faith grow. God. This is a personal issue with so many of us and so many in the room are probably in debt and money stresses them out. Lord, I pray that you would take away the stress of that worry. God, that you would allow them to begin to handle and, 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 and manage the resources that you've given to them in a healthy biblical way. And that in that and through that, you would give them peace, that you would give them joy, that you would, you would mend those relationships that they have where honestly, God, some of those relationships are in tension because of money and we're fighting about it. And so would you bring healing in those relationships as we center our life around you, God? We trust that you'll be faithful. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to this sermon from Foothills Church. If you made a decision to follow Christ while listening today, or if you have some more questions about what that looks like, then let us know. You can text FC Decision to 97000, or you can head over to foothillschurch.com slash decision. We hope you have a great week.